Hello everyone, welcome back. It's so good to see you guys. I've been in the chat a little bit before we started today and I'm super excited about that. Um, I hope you liked this story. I can't wait to hear what you thought about it. This was one of the few stories that when I was putting the two week unit together, I thought, oh yeah, 100% gift of the Magi. So this was one I knew it was gonna happen. So let's jump in. Um, the first thing I wanna start with, this story the same way as the last one which is the end and so in the introductory lesson if you saw that one i talked about edgar Allan poe's opinion that often the writer should start with the end and i think this story the power is in the end just like the necklace and i think that would make kind of an interesting paper if you ever have to write one so I just love this quote. Every time I read it, it brings me to my knees. And I've read this story at least a hundred times. I just love how it sounds. It's so gentle. It's so beautiful. And when you read it at Christmas, it just captures the spirit of the holiday so well. So I, I just love it. And I hope that you felt it too. Something's a little off. It looks like with the screen. Let me go see. Yeah, something's going on here. I'm seeing like two different things going on. Let me, you know what? Let me check that. So you're gonna see for a second, no um, PowerPoint behind me. You're just gonna see my face for a second because I'm gonna change a source. So hold on a minute and let me add a source. So I'll be going black for just a second. Um, I have to add anyway, it's just this backstream stuff. So um, I, I'm learning all the text. Some of you who watch like maybe even gamers online, um, they are really used to this, um, to the uh, like streaming and how you have to do it, but I am not. So let me, um, let me see what I can do with that. Let's see here. I want, the short story lesson gift of magi sorry you are having to see the uh you're having to see the back end of what this looks like but you know what it's still still not catching it hmm i wonder okay something there we go there we go okay sorry about that pause for technical difficulties and now i need to whoops hit the back sorry okay um there we go all right, now I need to make you, yeah, I know, it just needs to come to the front. Here we go. Um, I need to put my video to the back. Not sure how to do that. Maybe put this down here. Okay, hey, I just learned something new. Hmm. Um, so I love the end. Sorry, left that slide on there too long. Thanks for your patience. So I want to just give some shout outs. Now, I can't, I'm a little bit nervous about this. Look, it's still doing it. Why is it doing that? Do you see how you can see like part of the other slide? There we go. It's something about that. Okay, we'll, we'll work with it. Um, uh, I, I'm a little bit worried about all of, oops, calling out anyone because I'm worried I'll forget people. But I have to say, just some of you are just rock stars. You are rocking my world in the comments. I go back and look at the comments after because I can't catch them all during the live stream. But, oh man, you guys, you're just amazing. Um, I see your comments. I see how you're engaging. I see how you're connecting with each other. And I'm just blown away by you. I wish we could be in the same classroom, like in a real place together um, instead of, you know, quarantine. There are so many of you. It would just be an honor to to teach with you in real life. And um, again, I don't want to list names, but you know who you are and you're amazing and you're, you're just awesome. I'm loving it. So I saw, I'll answer a question while I'm here. When do I look at everyone's work? So I spent the whole morning looking at everyone's work and uh, I didn't get through all of it, but I will. I'm just going to keep going. So how my days have been going is reviewing work all morning. And yesterday I had to fix some tech issues. And then all afternoon and evening um, preparing the next day's lesson. And so um, I'm not keeping up with all of the evaluation, partly because I'm spending longer in it than I intended because you're amazing. Um, 
and I want to I want to read more. But that's how the that's how the writing revision is going. I reviewed quite a few of them and I leave comments. So you can tell if yours has been reviewed because I will 100% of the time leave a comment for that. So this was my favorite comment yesterday. I mean, there were so many, but this one made me laugh out loud because I am absolutely like, anyway, it was very flattering. So thank you. Um, I loved, I just want to give a little bit of a shout out to the responses to this prompt from yesterday. If you remember, we were working with prepositional phrases a little bit embedded in the lesson on the short story and they were Look, it's still doing that. Sorry, I'm distracted by my own. There's something about the thing. Okay, I can't. Let me see here. It's, as you can see, it's like showing two slides at once. And it's, for those of you who are curious about that, it's just um, the way that the PowerPoint is showing. But if I um, put it the way I want to see it, then I can't see the chat very well. So uh, anyway, hopefully that fixed it. We'll see. Okay, that's better. Sorry about that. Patience with the newbie. Um, okay, so when I looked at the responses to this from yesterday, I was so impressed and I want to highlight a, a few of them that I thought were really cool. So the lion thought of open grasslands, of running after prey in the wild, of having freedom, of being with other lions. And I, I wanna point out how just the addition of that word open here, um, it strengthens it so much. Also, notice the gerund, running after prey, having freedom, being with other lions. So the use of the gerund there. Notice it looks like a verb, but it's functioning here as a noun. It's functioning as the object of that preposition. So I really liked it. Now, if I were going to strengthen this a little bit, and I know this was just like post in the comments, you're not really working on it, no time for revision. But if I were going to strengthen a response like this, I would have strengthened that parallel structure. You've got some beautiful parallel structure, running, having, being, where you have these three um, like gerunds right in a row. You could have done that with open grasslands too by saying thought of gazing across open grasslands. Anyway, it wasn't the kind of thing where you would try a revision or try to strengthen it, but there was such an opportunity here for beautiful parallel structure that I wanted to point it out to you. I liked this one. The lion thought of metal bars, of the strange blobs watching him, of the freedom of his comrades, because this one shifted into the mind, not just of like lion in the global sense of the word, but a specific lion, like took us into the mind of a lion. I like that. And then another person did it even deeper, a specific lion who we all know, right? Lion guy, I read this, I was like, oh, Lion King, right? So nice job. Um, this one was nice. Um, again, there's some beautiful parallel construction and I'm noticing some of that parallel construction in your writing as well. And when I see it, I'm calling it out because it's so strong. There's the, the mind seeks pattern. And so when you put pattern in your writing, the, the reader will respond to that hundred percent of the time. Um, I saw this parallel construction twice in the comments. I already mentioned it before and I just loved it. I love that prepositional phrase within a prepositional phrase. So thank you, whoever did this one for a little English teacher present there. So I already mentioned the writing and I'm absolutely thrilled with how many of you are submitting writing. It's a lot of writing. I took just a screenshot of the writing and I promise I'm looking at each one. The samples that I choose that I share at the end of class, I'm choosing based on a variety of ages and grade levels, but I'm also choosing based on things I want to highlight. So some of you like the same thing is showing up in multiple ones that is worth highlighting. And so if I don't pick yours, it's not because it wasn't great. It's just that maybe I already had an example of what I wanted to do there. I really feel like I could do an entire class just on your writing because you are doing such a great job. I really, really wish I could show all of them because they all have something of value. And I want you to know that I very much appreciate the time that you're taking with them. It's, it's evident and appreciated. Okay, so jumping into the gift of the Magi, aren't these characters a change from yesterday? I mean, do you love them as much as I do? Like, could there be any bigger difference in a couple than the difference between Jim and Della and the difference between Madame and Monsieur Loiselle? Lo Seriously, I'm gonna do this again? Loiselle, right? Oh, it's so amazing. Um, so I'm just curious, did you like them? 
Um, yeah. Oh, so nice. Oh, yeah. I see a comment about don't share personal information. When I use examples of the writing, I always just say a 10th grader, a 9th grader, something like that. I'll never use names. Nope. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. You do like them. Yeah. I like them, too. I just love them. They're so nice. Um, so they're so fun. They're such a change. And I think that that in itself is a juxtaposition, right? Hopefully when you read this story and you saw that it ended very similarly, it's based on the same literary device of irony and a married couple at the center of it, but completely different. I hope that when you got to the end, some of you were like, oh, Mrs. Van, I see what you did there, right? You did your own juxtaposition. So I want to know, how did you like the story in general? So you like the people. Oh, oh, before I do that, before I do that, which version did you read? Okay, so a funny thing happened <laughs> on the way to doing the lesson is that I looked at, I'm reading it. I'm like, wait, my favorite word is missing. And I thought, what is going on? And I realized that in the original flyer that I made, I had linked to an, uh, like not necessarily a bridge. Yeah, it was abridged. It was like an abridged, simplified version. And I was like, what is this mischief? Right. And I realized, oh no. And so I, I tried to put it out everywhere I could, the longer version, but it's possible that as we're going through some of the wording that you're going to see, you didn't read because you read it before I found that or you, anyway, it's hard to fix stuff on the internet. Just life lesson. Um, but so some of you may have read the longer version and some of you may have read the abridged revised version. I have a link to the correct version in the flyer now. And so in the description of this, and I went back and fixed the other videos as well. So the flyer now has the links to all the correct ones. Cause I found out that that same thing had happened with two other stories. So my bad. Um, Okay, so did you like it? Scale of one to five. Remember, five is you just, you know, you just can't wait to read more and just love it and hope you never have to go back to real school so you can just read these stories that Mrs. Van is picking and a one being that you're never going to forgive your parents for making you take this class and read this stuff. So I'm just curious about it. Um, and while I'm seeing those numbers come in, I'll just mention the differences between the versions is length and simplified language. But the storyline and the main gist of it and even some of the literary devices are exactly the same. So love the characters and the feelings. Ooh, lots of high scores. The Gift of the Magi is sort of a cliche. Yeah, okay, it's become a cliche because of the popularity of the story, right? It wasn't a cliche when he wrote it. Ooh, a solid 10 on a scale of five. That's very nice. Um, and if you didn't get to read it, I saw a response that said that, don't worry about it. I think hopefully being in the class will make you interested in reading the whole thing. And a four, cause the end tortured you. I know it's so, oh, it's so, it's, a, it's yeah, stab in the heart. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's great if you can read the story ahead of time, but if you can't, you're totally welcome in class, right? Because part of what part of what teachers do is try to help, like people who become English teachers become English teachers because they love to read and they want students to want to love to read too. And so if you come to class and you haven't done the reading, you, you know, yeah, it's optimal if you've done the reading, but if you haven't, that's my job, right? My job is to make you want to do the reading. If you don't want to read it, then I've kind of let you down. So I don't mind if you come to class and you haven't and you haven't read it. That's OK with me. Right. I mean, I want you to read it, but but I I will I will pick that up. OK, so ready to dive in. Let's go. Let's go. Um, so let's visit the plot again. I just I like to visit the plot when we start, because that way, um, especially those of you who didn't get a chance to read it, um, will all be on the same page. Right. So in this story, Again, the plot's going to follow the same plot diagram as always. But you'll see later a little bit of a kicker um, that O. Henry does. Um, so, okay, let's, again, just like yesterday, let's compare what I thought versus what you thought. So, again, no right or wrong. No right or wrong. It's just opinion, right? So, the backstory. Poor but loving wife 
has no money, but wants a worthy gift for awesome husband. Then the inciting incident, she decides to sell her hair. Now, just like yesterday, I think you can make the argument that there is a different possibility for an inciting incident. So as I move forward with the plot, I'm going to be looking at comments to see if any of you have a different inciting incident than that. I think the inciting incident is when the moment when she decides to sell her hair. All right, next she gets her hair cut off. She uses the money to buy a watch chain for her husband and she tries to fix her hair and she fixes dinner too, right? And then the climax, the poor but loving husband tells the wife that he sold the watch to buy combs for her now cut off hair. Oh, right? Oh, and then they eat dinner. <laughs> the resolution is so, it's just, um, it's not even spoken, right? It's just like, uh, and, and then what you get in lieu of kind of a resolution of the people is that you get the narrator jumping in with this life lesson that we'll talk about. Um, okay. The, uh, I'm seeing an interesting comment from Juno that, um, they think that the backstory is the information about the, um, about the objects that the, that they cherish. And you are absolutely right that that is part of the story. I think that that I would include in the rising action because that's what's leading you to the climax. Like you need to know that in order to develop the emotional intensity that will lead you to the, to the climax. So yeah. Um, Let's see. What was the difference between $20 and $30 back then? Yeah, like a lot, right? I tried to look it up again, just like the money from the necklace. And I tried to look it up. Now imagine their rent for a week was $8. So imagine the difference of $10 is more than a week's rent. So quite a bit. So he's lost quite a bit of money when his um, income went from $30 to $20. Now, now their rent is taking up uh, almost half of their income, which is really hard then to meet your other meet your other um, obligations. All right, so uh, curious, curious, curious. Then we get to so that's this falling action. They eat dinner, and then the resolution. Beautiful, beautiful lines about the truest of gifts. So. Any thoughts about any disagreement with me on those plots? I've seen some of them already, but I'm curious. Any other ones? Falling action should could be that Jim gave Della the combs. Yeah, the difficulty with that, I don't disagree with you. The difficulty, though, is that that happens before she finds out that he sold the watch. And that is absolutely the emo moment of greatest emotional intensity when she finds out there is no watch. Um, but yeah. So I'm glad I didn't work back then for only $8, right? But you have to think everything's relative, although they are, I mean, the whole premise of the story is they have to be poor. If they're, if they're rich, this doesn't work, right? If they're, if they're wealthy, this doesn't work. Um, yeah. So yeah, she sold the hair for $20. It must've been a lot. And Chelsea, that's an important point. And I'm glad you said that because I wasn't even planning on mentioning it and it needed to be mentioned. Real human hair is very expensive. If you want to buy a wig, that's a long, long hair wig made of human hair and done well, it can cost thousands of dollars. So real human hair is very, very expensive. Um, when Jim comes home, I see somebody say it's a climax. When Jim comes home, that's still part of the rising action. Remember, rising action is not a flat line. Rising action is building to an emotional peak. It's like, and now you're almost there. Imagine rising action, like you're on a roller coaster at the part right before a hill where you can hear the gears turning and you know what's coming and your heart starts to race, right? So something doesn't have to be um, the climax just because it's exciting. The rising action will have lots of excitement as well. So, okay. Let's see. Next, um, $1.80. So we're going to jump into the a couple of examples of how the author shows us how poor they are. Because again, this is such an important part of the story. Like if you don't buy in, if you do not drink the Kool-Aid of how poor they are, this story will not have the impact on you that he wants it to, right? And he, he the whole story balances on this. 
you you have to believe they're really poor or you will not be able to understand the level of sacrifice that what would lead them to make that kind of sacrifice otherwise their sacrifice will seem like unthought out ridiculous stupid short-sighted you have to buy into the poverty now we can we don't need, and and we don't even really need to know how much money this is in today's dollars because the author tells us right that was all he says that was all and that's a good clue for those of you who when you're writing is that you don't have to do all these calculations like you don't have to put in parentheses and this is forty two thousand dollars in today's dollars right you don't need to do that you can just say something like that was all and it tells the reader really all they need to know it's not that much money and then he emphasizes again by having her counted out in pennies right because when you're counting something out in pennies pennies are the smallest unit monetary unit in American currency and so if you're counting stuff out in pennies some people don't even use pennies so it's it's like oh this is like nothing like it, this would be someone else's nothing so I lo love the way he shows how poor they are and he keeps going with how poor they are right in the vestibule below, and if you read the abridged revised version, it said in the hall. So a vestibule is like a hall or a foyer in an apartment building. So there was a letterbox into which no letter would go, an electric button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Again, notice this beautiful repetition. You're going to see a lot of it in this story too. So we know they live in a place where the, like the manager, the owner, the landlord or whatever doesn't even maintain it. And then... The Dillingham, which was like written on their nameplate, had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity. And this is what someone mentioned in the comments earlier, where the income goes from 30 to 20. Now, look at this last line. When the income was shrunk, the letters of Dillingham looked blurred as though they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D. Now, the author is using this to show us more just how poor they are. But I want to point out the figurative language example here. The letters in the mailbox are thinking. Now, I don't know about you, but like labels in my house don't do their own thinking, right? Like they just sit there. They are an inanimate, non-sentient object. So the letters are thinking. And this adds a moment of almost humor if you let yourself really think about it. Like the letters are thinking, should we just go from Dillingham to D? Like, is that what we should do? And in some ways, it becomes almost a cartoon, right? You can see that happening in a cartoon where the letters start going, we're not going to be Dillingham anymore. We're just going to be a D, right? And this, this literary technique is called um, personification. All right. So now I'm going to interrupt this to do our Sweet 16 because there's a beautiful adverbial clause here. And this comes in this line, in this line. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, take a look at the home. Now, um, what that meant what, when she stops sobbing and starts just sniffling, right? That's the first stage to the second. This narrator is really interesting. I don't know how many of you um, like noticed that, that the narrator was interesting. The narrator almost... Uh, acts like a stage director like and now think this and now look at this and now you should be doing this and now here's the lesson I want you to get so the, the that narration is interesting um, the part in this sentence that starts with wall and goes all the way through to second is an adverbial clause now it, and what's interesting about it is it's longer than the main part of the sentence right the sentence is take a look at the home that's, that's the main sentence clause, right? And so then there's this adverbial clause before it while the mistress is doing this, right? So I want to take a look at this and what kind it is because it's one of our sweet 16. Jane, yes, the narrator breaks the fourth wall. Just like yesterday, they did it briefly. This narrator does it, <clears throat> excuse me, much more. All right, so let's look at it. We've got the mistress and then is gradually subsiding. So we've got a... Uh, subject, the mistress, and meaning like the mistress of the house, is gradually subsiding. So that's our, our verb phrase, right? So we've got a subject and a verb that makes it a clause. When you have a subject and a verb, it's a clause in, as opposed to a phrase. And this phrase, this one is an, a, an adverb phrase. Now, adverb phrases, remember, we only have three kinds of, or, I'm sorry, adverb clause. Ooh, I don't want to mislead you. Adverb clause. Um, 
remember, there are only three kinds of clauses, and this is one of them, and they are dependent on what they do. So adverb clauses are really powerful, underused tool in the toolbox, my friends. So here, here are all the things that adverb clauses do, and I'm going to show you examples of every single one. This is actually one of the most fun things I did last night, was coming up with examples of different adverb clauses. So adverb clauses can tell you more about the time, and you'll clue in by the... Um, by the conjunction that's being, like by the, by the word that's being used to tell you, that guide you into the clause. So time, we see time, which is one of our example words here is while, and that's exactly the word we see in this sentence, while the mistress of the home, right? That's telling us adverb clause, telling us more about when this is happening. It can tell us about place. It can tell us about the reason or the cause, right? Like, because this happened, it can tell us the purpose, so like why, it can tell us the why, that's an adverb, will tell us why. And then it can also tell us the result, like what happened as a result of this. And it can also show condition, and I'm gonna show you examples of that, because condition is one of the harder ones to figure out. It's very subtle, very sophisticated. Those of you who are under 10th grade, um, if you can use an adverb clause with regard to condition appropriately, you might want to warn your teacher ahead of time because they just might have a heart attack. All right, so let, let's jump into examples. Okay, before the clock strikes three, the princess will make a run for it. So adverb clauses can show time, right? They could show time. Now notice that they can come at the beginning and they can, and then they need a comma. Before the clock strikes three, the princess will make a run for it. If they come at the end, I'll go with you after I eat this blue bonnet ice cream. I, then I should have said blue bell. I don't know why I typed bonnet. Blue bell ice cream is a religion where I live in Texas. Okay, so I'll go with you after I eat this blue, blue bonnet ice cream, blue bell ice cream, after I eat this favorite brand of ice cream, then um, that doesn't need a comma. Just pro tip, right? Now, um, let's look at the next one. This one shows place. Dobby slept wherever he was allowed to sleep. Non-example, Dobby slept in the kitchen. Notice, in the kitchen is just a phrase. In the kitchen. Prepositional phrase, just like we learned about yesterday. Dobby slept wherever he was allowed to sleep. That wherever, clue that it might be a clause, and then look at it. The subject, he, and then this, this predicate, was allowed to sleep. So this is actually an entire clause by itself. Dobby slept wherever he was allowed to sleep, and that is a clause. Non-example is that phrase. Now, again, you can reverse the order on clauses. So I could put that clause in the beginning of the sentence. It makes sometimes for an awkward construct, so you have to decide if that's what you want to do. But think of this. Wherever he was allowed to sleep, comma, Dobby slept. When you choose that, it's whatever you want to emphasize. It's whatever you want the reader to pay the most attention to. It's whatever you think is the most important. So if you think the most important thing is the place, like wherever he was allowed to sleep, that's where Dobby slept, then you put that first. If you think the most important thing is that Dobby gets to sleep, then you put that there in the beginning. All right. This one shows the reason or the cause, right? Arthur was able to pull the sword from the stone because he was the rightful king. Again, I could reverse it, right? Because he was the rightful king, Arthur was able to pull the sword from the stone. It depends on what you want to emphasize. Oh, I anyway, ah, I just love it. English, it's, it's amazing. All right, and then here's one that shows a purpose. In order to become a doctor, Vanit had to go to a billion years of school. Well, I could easily switch that, right? Vanit had to go to a billion years of school in order to become a doctor. Right, I could do that, right? And that that would be an example of where you, yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I could go on. I have to stop myself. I have to dial myself back here. All right, and then this is a result. This is a result, right? The child was so bored, and as a result of that boredom, she decides to go clean her room. Okay, so this is an adverb clause showing a result. Again, I could I could switch it around. Like she decided to clean her room because she was so bored. Okay, then here is a condition one. Remember I said this is the trickiest one. This is a tricky one. Tricky, tricky. They decided to keep trying even though they'd never won a game in 30 years. Right? That's, that's a condition. You'll see these adverb clauses start with like, although, even though, if. 
unless stuff like that. Now, um, let's see. I, I would say that on a scale of one to 10 in how important adverb clauses are in writing, I would give them on a scale of one to 10, I would give them a 9.2. Pretty important. All right. So now you're going to try it and I'm going to have you try it both ways. And I got some feedback that it's harder to think about it when I keep talking. So I'm going to try to pause longer. It's just weird because I'm just sitting here like in silence, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. Those of you who know me in real life know that um, silence is not my strength. Okay, so we're going to add a clause. The fairies walk through the field. Now remember that adverb clauses can be used to show time, place, reason, result, purpose, or condition. And so I want you to make to add something to the fairies walk through the field in order to show any one of these things. Any one of these things. Um, time, place, reason, result, purpose, condition. So the fairies walk through the field... So, yeah. The fairies walk through the field as they had to get to the other side, right? So there's purpose or reason, right? There's a reason. They have to get to the other side. Um, Cloudfly, I see the comment that you're a bit confused. I Tell me specifically what's confusing. I'll try to glance at that. Nice. I hope that you guys are seeing some of the other people's responses and noticing how you, when you see a response that has like an interesting idea or a strong word, um, then you, you just like, oh, that's nice, right? You don't even have to be an English teacher to notice when something is really cool. Somebody asked, what makes a clause a clause? A clause is a clause if it can stand on its own. Technically, a sentence is a clause. I mean, a, a, a full sentence is a clause. It, stand, it can stand on its own. It has to have a subject and it has to have a predicate, so a verb, right? And if it has both a subject and a verb, then it's a clause. We use clause to distinguish it from a phrase, which a phrase does not have both components of what it takes to make a sentence. Um, that's nice even though they got eaten by the children in the field. Some of you have some dark humor. All right, now we're gonna try the opposite. Let's try the opposite. We did, we put the main part of the main clause of the sentence in the beginning and then we put our adverb clause after it. Now I want you to try putting in a sentence first, like what's our main clause first and then this is the adverb clause that follows it. So what could possibly go before here? I've got an adverb clause showing condition Show me a sentence that could go in front of that adverb clause showing condition. So I want to see this, even though it would not be daylight for three more hours, put something before that. Yes, Anna, that's an independent clause. Mm -hmm. An independent clause can stand by itself. Oh, I'm supposed to be quiet. People tried to kill the vampire even though it would not. Oh, the people tried to kill him. I'm trying to read these so fast. It's so fun. You guys are doing a great job. A number of you are picking up on how, like, cluing into what would be out at night, right? So I'm seeing werewolves and vampires and, and fairies and things that we associate with night. But then others of you are not doing that. You're going, 
nice suit you fit. The robbers ate the pizza, even though that's funny, Abby. Okay, shout out to the person who commented on Nancy Drew because I just love Nancy Drew. All right, you guys have got it. You've got these clauses that these adverb clauses that we can add before or after you are writing great full responses and it's beautiful you're doing a really good job all right so um and and thanks to the person who corrected me because i just kept saying clause and i should have been saying independent clause so we want to be specific all right so back to the literature back to the story um there's this interesting line because we've got a lot of repetition as i mentioned in this story and um in fact our anaphora from yesterday makes an appearance again i don't know if you noticed that or not but here the repetition has a specific purpose it's serving to amplify the mood um even the adverb dully is gray right so notice that notice that the author has alignment in the whole structure like it all works together and this is particularly interesting because this author o henry he was not really known for style his his real strength was in making connection with readers and not necessarily for stylistic strength and yet this story does have some really obvious examples of stylistic choice um now, have you ever seen a gray backyard? It says a gray cat walking on a gray fence. That's that's not that unusual. But in a gray backyard, but that's not that common. And it makes it more effective because it's not common. If you as a writer say something like, he walked out onto the green grass, the reader is like, green grass, yawn, right? It's the fact that we don't expect to hear about a gray backyard. So remember, this is what we use repetition for emphasis, clarity, amplification and emotional effect. And so that's what they're doing here. A little bit of amplification of how gray is it? It's so gray, right? That's what's going on. Now, there's this interesting line throughout the story. There are just all these little universal truths, right? Expenses have been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Right. And so it's like the narrator comes in to say, and here's the lesson, children. Right. Um, little connections to everyday experience, little connections to our real lives and what we experience. We've all had this experience. We've all had the experience that stuff costs more than we thought it would or that we think it should. Right. And that is part of O. Henry's charm. Part of O. Henry's charm is that he connects to universal experience. Now, we get to the part that someone said they felt like could be um, really part of the backstory, right? That there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's, and the other was Della's hair. Now, O. Henry here, he's going to tell us how amazing um, these things are by using another literary device. And the literary device that he's going to use here is um illusion he's gonna make a reference now this did not show up in the this showed up in an in a different way in the abridged version so in that version i've oh got it right here in that version it says that if the um if a queen had lived in the room near theirs and in talking talking about her hair and when talking about the watch said if a king had lived in the same house um if a king had lived in the same house with all his riches blah blah, blah. in the in the original version of the story it says if the queen of sheba who was a specific person and if king solomon so there you go so the allusions are to the queen of sheba and the king and king solomon and and allusions are the reader's reward the reason I say that is because um, that I got, I, I just saw a comic of I that I want to try to remember after I say this and I don't know if I can. We'll see. All right. So um, th this illusion rewards the reader just like a lot of illusions do. Illusions are references to other stories, to songs, to plays, to common sayings, to historical events, to other books, to plays, to all, all this stuff. I may have said plays twice. And in this case, this is biblical illusion because in the Bible, 
the queen of Sheba come, and you can read about it in first Kings chapter 10, the queen of Sheba comes to King Solomon and she brings a retinue of camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. But she's known as like the wealthiest person ever, right? In fact, later in Second Chronicles, it says no one had ever given Solomon as many spices as he got from the Queen of Sheba. So she's just like immensely wealthy. And then King Solomon himself was famous for being fabulously wealthy. Like, he built the temple of King Solomon that was known for its its jewels and its riches. And so both of these people are known for riches, but they're only known for riches if you know the story. So it doesn't actually matter in any way whether you are religious or not. You need to read the Bible to understand illusion. Almost all quality literature makes at least one elusive reference to the Bible. It, it, it is impossible to avoid. And it can range from things as specific as this like the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon, to like Noah's Ark, right? Like or Rain and Rain or Daniel and Lion's Den and Common Stories. But you do need that. Um, you, you do need that background. If you're really going to study literature and understand literature, you need to know that. Okay, um, next. Another piece of figurative language talking about the hair. There's this simile, rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. And it, it follows this, loving couplet of verb. I just, I just love this, these rippling and shining, right? Rippling is a less common, like we're used to hearing hair referred to as shining, like that's a nice quality, shiny hair, partly because, you know, hopefully that means it's clean. Um, but rippling is, is less common. And he's got this nice couplet of verbs, rippling and shining. And then this simile, like a cascade of brown waters. And I think what's interesting in this line Brown is beautiful, cascaded brown waters, but brown water is usually not beautiful, right? Brown water usually is muddy water or dirty water or stagnant water. So we're not really used to seeing brown waters used, but because he's got these beautiful verbs with it, we can tell, oh, this is supposed to be a good quality. But then watch this. Seriously, in the very next paragraph, right? We see on went her old brown jacket, on went her old brown hat. So now the same exact color being used to describe beauty in the last sentence is now being used to describe the poverty again, right? The drabness again. The, the, he's creating this mood of grayness, of brownness, that there's just no color because there's no money. Now what's interesting here, here's the anaphora, on went her old, on went her old, right? And so we've got that beautiful anaphora again. It's so interesting to me. Okay, next, let me go to our next sentence I wanna look at. So she lets down her hair and she looks at it and she she's made this decision, right? And these moments right here are the only moments in the story where we see her really struggling with the decision, with worrying about what she's doing, with recognizing that she's taking this hair. And we don't see this internal conflict. We, the author doesn't let us into her mind. The author just shows us her actions, right? She, she does it up nervously. He uses an adverb so that we know she's nervous. Once she faltered, right? Now he's using a verb to tell us. Um, she cries a tear or two. And then when she goes into the store to sell the hair, give it to me quick right? Like pulling out the band-aid, right? Do it fast. And one of the reasons that this is strong is that we can all relate to this, right? Like we can all relate to the idea of knowing that we have to do something that we don't want to do or knowing that something's going to be done to us that we don't want to be done, right? Like we're going to have to get a shot or blood drawn or something like that. We don't want it. Stitches taken out, something, something that we know is going to hurt in some way, either emotionally or physically. And we're just like, just do it, right? Just do it. And we can totally relate to that because we can relate to that idea of hoping against hope kind of so powerful. All right. So I'm going to ask a question. It is perhaps the most important moment of the story when her hair actually gets cut off. I mean, it's, it's like, she cuts off her hair, which is one of the two most important things that the household possesses. 
And we don't even hear about it. It goes straight from give it to me quick until now it's all over. And so I'm going to be quiet while I watch this. Why do you think that O. Henry doesn't describe the actual cutting off of the hair? Why do you think he doesn't describe that? So I'll watch for your responses. Less painful for readers. His point has been made. Nice. Too Okay, I'm just seeing so many of this similar ideas of like, I'm seeing some really interesting ideas here. And they all center around the fact that he's transferring the power of the moment from the narrator to the reader. And if you were in the first class, you know that one of the things that's in a short story is the idea that the reader has to bring more to it. And this scene is perfect for that. Like he isn't going to describe like the sound of the scissors at the first snip and the sight of the hair falling to the floor. The reader can feel that. And somebody commented like you just, it's, it's like the, the swiftness of it, right? Like it's so fast. I think that that's an important point, right? That you can make a decision that's super important and then it could just be a split second, right? And that totally changes your life. Um, the idea that, that, we're, we're seeing this from Della's perspective and she just doesn't even want to see it. It's almost like the reader is being blocked out of it in the same way that she might be blocking herself out of it. Ooh, such an inf a, a whole interesting idea. Now, a couple of people are like, did she like shave her head? No, no, they just like cut it short. They just like cut it short. But it had been all the way, if you remember, it like fell to her knees. You know, so. Okay, nice. Nice. Okay. Thank you for sharing your ideas there. Okay. So then after that, we get this um, where she, we get again where we don't really see it. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. And we're like, what is it? What is it? And then finally he tells us, oh, it's this watch chain. Um, we just see the pronoun and we have to wait for the reveal. This is this idea of micro suspense. And, and it's an underused strategy that I think some of you could, could use. Um, where you just, just the use of a pronoun instead of the noun, right? Instead of saying, she found the perfect present at last. It was a watch chain, right? Like just, just saying it out loud it, it robs us of the suspense. But there creates a little emotional intensity here by not telling us exactly what it was. Now, one of the things, uh, this word meretricious is an uncommon word now. And meretricious means it looks expensive, but it doesn't really have any value. Like fool's gold, like um, like prizes that you get at, at, you know, Chuck E. Cheese or whatever. I mean, I'm not dissing Chuck E. Cheese, but you know, like it looks shiny, but it's not really gold. That's meretricious. And so it's saying that this thing it doesn't, it's, it's quiet. It doesn't need to be shiny and blingy to proclaim its value. It, it proclaims its value in a, in a deeper, more authentic way. And it says, as all good things should do. Again, that little, and here's a life lesson, reader. Um, another one that we get, all good thing, as all good things should do. All right, so one thing, if you read the unabridged version. And one thing that might be interesting for some of you is if you read the the revised version, the abridged revised version, go read the full longer version and just compare the differences. That would be an interesting exercise. But in the full version, we get this like big long words. Uh-oh, look at the time. Um, 
what is with these big long words? Um, and there are so many, oh, let me go back to this, so many unfamiliar words in this story. And when you encounter an unfamiliar word, it's important to have a strategy. You have to decide what you're going to do with it. Like, how are you going to handle it? Some people are going to just skip it unless it means that they don't understand what it means. Some people will use context clues. Some people will look it up. You could even say like, Alexa, what does meretricious mean? Oh, she didn't, she didn't hear me. The adjective meretricious is usually defined as alluring by a show of flashy or vulgar attractions, Posi. For more, ask me to That's awesome. I, I, I should have realized that Alexa would talk to me. All right. Um, so then it was even worthy of the watch, right? Capitalized to emphasize its value. Now, look at the way he shows res the respect. Look at the way that O. Henry shows the respect that's at the root of their love for each other. Um, at the root of her love for him is this respect, quietness and value. She doesn't need him to be rich. She doesn't need him to be blingy and shiny, right? She doesn't need him to be meretricious. It is, it, it's not like, oh, look how super cute he is. That's not what she is looking for. All right, interrupt the program to talk about narration. And just as a heads up, I made a decision yesterday based on comments that I wasn't going to worry so much about time. So you, they are recorded. If you don't want to watch the whole thing, you don't have to, or you can come back and watch it later. But I'm going to do the whole lesson no matter how much time it takes. Um, so make your choices. All right. So let's look at narration, just inserting a little lesson on narration because there's a, a narration issue going on in this story. So narration is the point of view from which the story is being told. Who is the narrator? What role does the narrator play within the story? So in first person narration, what we have is um, where, uh, so in, I've got this diagram to show you. Um, that where is the narrator in the story and what's the relationship between the narrator and the other characters in the story. So in first person narration, this is when the narrator calls himself I, the narrator is actually in the story. Like the narrator is a character in the story. And you see these lines with the dots at the end, that means the narrator can't read their mind. If you see an arrow in the diagram, it means that the narrator can read their mind. So in first person narrative, the narrator can't read the character's minds. The narrator um, is in the story themselves. They only know what they themselves are thinking. In third person omniscient, the narrator is not a character in the story. The narrator is telling the story, but is not a character in the story. And in third person omniscient, the narrator can see into the minds of all the characters. He may, or she may not be, the narrator may not be telling you what everybody's thinking all the time, because that would just be too much. But the narrator could, if they wanted to, go into the minds of any of the characters. And that's their person omniscient. Notice the arrows. I can go into the mind of anybody. And the story is told in the third person, which is he, she, it, they. Third person limited omniscience is when the narrator sees into primarily the mind of one character. So you see the arrow going to one character and dots going to the other characters, right? Only one. This is probably the most common form of narration where it's third person, but we're really seeing the story from the point of view of a particular character. Every now and then, the narrator might jump into another character just briefly, like maybe a sentence or so, but mostly inside the head of one person. Now, third person objective is when the thoughts and characters are not at all, the thoughts of the characters aren't at all revealed. The narrator is outside the story and cannot read the minds of any of the characters. They sometimes call this the keyhole technique because it's like you're looking through a keyhole and it's just describing what you see, but you don't really, you can't really see the background. You can't really see what's going on. All right, so let's look at this. Can you match them? So look at the diagrams on the right and just do, check yourself. Can you tell which one goes with which, right? Give you a second there. Now, O. Henry does something really interesting with narration, really unusual. He has a shifting narrative voice. He uses third person limited omniscient. We, when we see into anybody's mind, it's Della's, but mo most of the time he's third person objective. We're just seeing the actions. We're not really seeing into the minds of anybody. Um, and he even shifts into first person for a while at the end, and that's unusual. But then what's really unusual is that he shifts at one point into second person, and that's not even on the list because it's so uncommon. 
Second person is when you go into you. So um, it's like, take a look at the home. You, take a look at the home, right? So already introduced to you as Della. That second person, it's so unusual. It's really not common. We get another example, um, and we get another example at another point in the story. And so that's just really interesting. So you you must analyze the narrator. You must decide what is the narrator's point of view. And the reason you have to decide it is because the author will use narrative point of view to manipulate you or not. You are more manipulated in certain points of view than others. And you have to decide as a, narr- as a reader, how manipulated is this author trying to make me? All right. We will go back to regular scheduled programming of the um, of the book. So, and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love, which is always a tremendous task, dear friends, a tremendous task. I thought this idea that generosity plus love can actually create damage that has to be corrected. And it reminded me of the story, The Giving Tree. I don't know if any of you have ever read that story. Um, and then she's worried, right? Why is she worried? She's worried because she's worried about what he's going to think about her. And I think that scene where she's worried about is, is she going to, is he going to still think she's pretty shows the difference between the relationship between this couple and the couple in the necklace. I think that there's so much difference in them. Um, yeah, I'm just giving one second to think about that. They're so different, and I think it's captured right here in this moment. That's what she's worried about. She's worried not about herself, not about her own loss, but about how he will take it. Now, there's this falling action hiccup where um, normally the plot's like this. Normally the plot's like this, right? But then it does this here where um, the there's this little micro climax on the way back down, and there's this emotionally and dramatically intense moment when he sees her and she knows he's going to see her and the thing that's most cherished about her physically is gone and so that that's what that scene was and it's this little hiccup like another moment of little burst of 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 intensity right and there's this expression on the face and here we see this this repetition again we see this um repetition beginning the phrase again uh, the anaphora nor 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 and it's another example of dramatic irony and what's interesting is in this case the character jim knows something that della doesn't know and the reader doesn't know we don't know yet that he sold the watch so she cuts off her hair to buy a chain for his watch and we don't know that he sold the watch to buy we don't know yet right we don't know this yet um did you find yourself thinking about like what his face looked like here? Like I I did. I don't know if any of you ever do this, but sometimes if I read something in a book and it says like the character gasped, I find myself I'll go like, oh, right? Like I do it. I don't know if any of you do that. I do that. All right. So then we get this unusual example of foreshadowing because it's so blatant, right? This dark assertion will be illuminated later on. Authors hardly ever do that. In fact, this one is a total giveaway because it says the Magi brought valuable gifts and we don't even know what the Magi are like. It's gonna, we don't even know. This is going to be the big ending. All right. Okay. I want you to vote. I want you to vote. Theme moment. There are multiple themes in this story. There is the theme of love. There is the theme of wealth versus poverty. There is the theme of the true meaning of giving. There is a theme of sacrifice. I think you could argue there are more. I'm going to stick with those four. Okay, so these four themes, love, wealth versus poverty, the true meaning of giving, and sacrifice, which one do you think is the most important and the most important in in the story? Sacrifice, sacrifice. I'm watching the responses come in because remember there's a delay, so it takes a moment. Giving love, nice. So some different opinions. I love that. I absolutely love that. Okay. Some people have strong feelings about this. Nice. Nice. Okay. 
All right, then let's go. So the combs, now we get the description of the combs and the combs is capitalized just like the watch was to show the equality of the importance. And I've seen people say this line, that this line about her heart craving and yearning for the combs is an example of personification. And I, I don't know that I buy that because your heart, like when I say like my heart and my mind, that's really who I am. That is my person. And so I'm not sure that I agree with that. And I think that like, like our heart is us. And I think it brings up an important point, which is that there's no one right or wrong answer in analyzing literature, right? There's reasonable answers and unreasonable answers. Like you can have an unreasonable response, an irrelevant response, a ridiculous response, but the idea of something being correct or incorrect. And I think here the idea of whether this is personification or not is not necessarily that important of an idea. And you're always invited to disagree with analysis because of this, because of this truth, that the purpose of strong reading is to make you a thinker, right? It's not about the reading. It's about the thinking. And it's, it's the, the point of reading, especially reading and really analyzing what you read, is to make you someone who is not at the mercy of what other people tell you to believe. And when you, when you practice that with reading, where you can do it at your own pace in your own time, you become better at it when you hear it on the news or on the radio or, or just from a friend. You become a better thinker. So then this is kind of interesting. This is how Della reacts when she opens up these combs and she knows, I don't have this hair anymore. These combs cannot be used by me right now. But look at how she responds to them. She hugs them to her bosom and then she says, my, and she looks up at him with, with dim eyes and a smile, right? A smile. Like, she's sad, but she's smiling. She said, my hair goes so fast, Jim. Right? Like, she still, I just, I just could not help that, right? Like, so, here we go. She tells us, I sold the watch. to buy you go into the now. Like, this ending, it's just so amazing. It's just so amazing. Um... Like, oh, I saw the, he's so calm. It's like this moment where all becomes clear and it's so intense. And then it's like, uh, right? So I'm curious, what do you think? In what ways are the combs and the watch similar? And in what ways are they different? Like how, they're, they're very different objects, I know that. But, but what is like similar and different about the sacrifice between selling the watch versus selling your hair. And oh, I want to answer questions, but I also want to be quiet. Sorry, Irene. Okay. It says in the end that this was a story about two people who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasure of their house. And I think this word unwisely is a challenge to the reader. The author is inviting the reader to argue back. They weren't unwise or they, yeah, they were totally stupid, right? So hint, older students, you're going to see this idea later in the writing assignment. And then it ends with this beautiful line, the stab in the heart line, the line that 20 years from now, when you're reading this story to your own children at Christmas, you'll get to this line and you'll just remember the first time that you read it and you'll be like, oh, right? It's so powerful. And there are so few stories that give you this in a single moment. It's so, so beautiful. I'm curious about what you think about whether you, um, about whether it would have been different and in what way it would have been different if only one of them had done it. What if only one of them had sold the thing and the other one had it? Like what if he sold his watch, but she hadn't sold her hair? Like how would it have been different? It's kind of interesting idea to think about. Um, All right, so I'm going to skip that little bit right there to get to this part. Learning from some writing rock stars. You know what? You know what? I can't. I, I just can't. Okay, first of all, I would like you to consider um, filling in this line. I would never give up 
and then either a thing or an opportunity and don't you don't need to put this in the chat but just think to yourself I would never give up this for anyone, no matter how much I love that person. And the reason that that's an important question to answer is because it will tell you like what's at the core of your being. Like, who are you really? If you, when you decide what you won't give up, that's where you learn what's really important to you. And when you know what's really important to you, you know who you are. And I think this question is worth reflecting on later. Again, you don't need to, um, put it in the chat, but it's an interesting idea. So I hope you love this story as much as I did. If you didn't read it yet, I hope you want to go read it now and find out what it's all about and why we're all so excited about it. And um, now, oh, and just, I saw somebody mention it in the chat before we even started today. They made a Sesame Street episode of it. It's shown up in a lot of things. There was a Mickey Mouse one in the Sesame Street one. Um, they sell, anyway, it's, it's fun. They do the same thing. Like they sell a um, paperclip collection to get a soap dish to hold the rubber ducky, but he sold the rubber ducky to get a cigar box to hold the paperclip collection. It's kind of funny. All right. Now we're on to writing rock stars. So we're, we're, um, at 105 and I'm going to go through more writing than I've done the last couple of days. And so it's longer. So if you don't want to watch this part, that's okay. Go back into the folder. Um, at when I'm done talking, I'll put the writing prompt there. Um, in the folder for today and you can in the description box of the video you'll be able to get a link to where you can go to that writing folder but i want to show this writing i want to look at it because i think that you guys can benefit from seeing the comments about other people's writing you really can learn a lot from exemplars from each other so let's look again i just picked some examples so up through eighth grade so these are some of these are fifth grade sixth grade seventh grade okay they panicked so this was, um, this question was about um, what they could have done instead, right? What could they have done instead? So it says, they panicked and it caused them to make a decision that was arguably very unwise. Losing a piece of jewelry should not have um, caused, we, we could have said, should not have been caused for an already unhappy, distraught couple to have to live 10 years in poverty, paying off debt. I think the wise decision would have been, right? Okay, so... I love the way this is a sixth grader and I love the way this writer kept the through line of the argument. It was unwise and here's what would have been wise. So keeping that through line, um, that's nice. A couple ways to strengthen it. That, that line should not have cause needs massaging. You could just take out the have leaving should not cause. That would be fine. Um, and there is what we would call a comma splice error down at the very end. Um, because there's really two separate sentences, they need stronger punctuation or division. Uh, th but those types of construction things, they can be fixed just with revision. Start with spending your energy on the idea and then revise for your grammar and syntax. Get the strength of your idea out first because grammar and syntax is something that you can fix without as much energy. Use your energy um, on the idea. So, and that this person did it. And then this is part of the same response. It's altogether possible she would have been angered by the loss of her necklace, right? It, it's possible that that um, she she would have been mad that her necklace was, was lost, but at least they would know the necklace was real and not just a cheap imitation. And several of you pointed that out, that that, that would have been a better option. Acknowledge, and here this writer does something really important. It says, acknowledging opinions opposite is a key strategy where she says it's altogether possible she would have been angered right i acknowledge that it might not have gone well and it takes the wind out of the sails of people who might disagree with you so it's really a strong idea and i loved seeing that here for someone who's only in sixth grade recognizing that when you acknowledge an opinion opposite you strengthen your own argument and weaken the argument of your opponent beautiful all right so here's a second sample and this one um, is I, I just, this was an eighth grader and I just want to show another example of that same acknowledging opinion opposite, right? Although this is true, the absolute worst case with telling the truth is better than the best case of lying. This is beautiful. This was an eighth grader who had gone through a list of a bunch of possible consequences and then ends with this. This is strong. I'm telling you, acknowledging opinion opposite is a strategy that is underused and really super powerful. Okay. Next. Oops. Um, this is really sample three. Sorry, got a little typo in that. Okay, next sample. 
this sixth grader literally rewrote the story. It was so cool. Um, I've changed a little bit of the punctuation. Oh, oh, wait a minute. That's not the right one. Okay, here, this one. I really loved that how this writer, this is still someone um, through eighth, somewhere between fifth and eighth grade, said, um, if, if she hadn't gone to all this trouble, she wouldn't have been humbled and she wouldn't have changed as a person, right? Basically, this person is making the argument, this is what makes her a dynamic character. If she had not done this, she would have been a static character and stayed who she was. And that was a powerful argument. It was impressive to me. All right, next sample is the person who um, rewrote the story as a story. Like rather than, than telling me how the story would have been different, rewrote the story. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting. I changed the punctuation. Now notice that in dread gives us a little clue how she's feeling. In dread, she walked to her friend's house. She puts this prepositional phrase here that is functioning as an adverb phrase because saying how did she walk? She walked in dread. So, so nice. She knocked. She could feel and see it's telling me the feeling. The butterflies flying in her stomach. The door creaked open. Come in. Have you come to return my necklace? Right? And we're all like, ah. And then, oh, I'm sad to say I lost your necklace. And then she says, oh, it was fake. Right? And so instead of just telling me what could have happened, the person rewrote the story. I just, I just thought that was super cute. I got a big kick. Got a big kick out of that story. All right. Next. For the next 10 years, they didn't have a life. And this is a solid, strong statement. Now, to make this statement even stronger, draw the connection between how before this, they only lived for status and wealth and how they lost both, right? You need, in order to say they had no life, because technically they are living, right? They're breathing, they're working, they live in a house or an apartment or whatever. Um, but talk about how they were forced to find new meaning and you could strengthen it even further by discussing whether that meaning was meaningful. Like, what do you think? What do you think could have happened because of this? And you will have made one of the strongest arguments possible um, that you could have done with this prompt. Um, agreed. If she'd known it was fake, she wouldn't have worried about it. And then what would happen, right? This is quite possibly true. This is quite possibly true. And to make this stronger, acknowledge the negative consequences that could have come from that as well. When you want to strengthen your thinking, consider possible different perspectives. How else could this be looked at? That's part of acknowledging the opinion opposite. Include those possible negatives. Include those possible opposites in your writing. 100% of the time, that will strengthen your writing. And I don't say 100% of the time with regard to writing very often. Now, consider that she may not have even wanted to borrow it if she knew it was fake because she was so shallow. So look beyond the obvious. All right, ninth through 10th grade, first sample. One way the story might have shifted if we'd known all along the necklace was fake is our attitudes towards the characters. For example, even though Matilda already seemed self-indulgent and may have increased our dislike of the character, increased dislike, how could that possibly be? Well, and then, the re like, we already don't like this person. So the writer is making an assertion that is pretty strong. Look how they do it. They do such a good job. When she went to her friend's house to borrow a necklace, she seemed unimpressed with the collection. Readers may feel a sense of satisfaction here, knowing she was receiving imposter jewels. I love that, right? Like, so the Germans have a word for this. It's called schadenfreude. It's it's taking pleasure at the pain of others. So if we knew the necklace was fake and she gets there and we know she's borrowing a fake necklace, we might be like, she's getting a fake necklace and you deserve it, you jerk, right? So I just love that. All right, next sample for our ninth and 10th graders is um, that knowing ruins the whole point of reading until the end, right? If we knew the necklace was fake, the only thing left to read is to see how she would react, right? And then, and then this is what's interesting. I want to highlight this aspect. This is a 10th grader. Do you see how they say the thing and then they give us a specific example that we can relate to from our own life, right? That we can relate to from our own life. And they may not agree with you. The reader may not agree with you yet about the story, but what they are doing is they cannot help but agree with the parallel because you've drawn a parallel that we can all relate to. This is a super strong writing technique. Give a general response like to the story and then tell how that looks in real life. So, so beautiful. Um, there was a 10th grader. I didn't get it included in the examples because I read it after I'd already put together a slide deck, but there was a 10th grader who said, if we had known 
she, Miss Madame Loiselle, would have seemed more moral. That that she would have worked all that time for something that, even though she knew it wasn't worth that much, would have made her a stronger, better person. And I thought that was perhaps the strongest argument I read. All right, 11th through 12th grade. Oops, went too quickly. When one thinks about how a wife and husband deserve each other, it tends to be in beautiful ways. Again, notice this beautiful, strong opening showing the opposite thing. And the, the necklace introduces us to two characters that deserve each other. Again, say who deserve each other in the worst possible way. I love that. I would, to strengthen this, I would maybe change the syntax of that in ways of their love creating. That phrase is a little awkward. I might use a transition like such as, um, transition words of your friend. But I, I love the strength of this argument. I love the idea that you deserve each other in the worst possible way. And then this line was from the same response, same writer. At the party, the author reveals that she revels in the company. <gasps> I love the alliteration of the verbs here. This was so beautiful. Just one letter separates reveals from revels. And revels is such a strong, evocative verb. So bravo if this is yours. And then this is that same person. These two characters deserve each other in the way fire deserves gasoline. Like, oh, I just like, I literally leaned back in my chair when I read that. I was like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, so just is so beautiful. Good job. Good job. Okay. Um, then I love this one. This is actually sample two, not sample one. Um, but the wrongfully chosen, this person titled their response. And I love that. When you put a title on your response, you honor it. You say, this is worth a name. Right. Whenever you give something a name, you give it power, you give it meaning, you give it strength. And so by naming the response rather than just calling it the necklace, right, by calling it wrongfully chosen. Another thing this does is that it gives the reader a hint of your argument, which is important. And then I love this starting with a question. Starting with a question is super nice. It gets the reader's brain pumping a little. This 12th graders response began and ended strongly. Let's look at the ending. In this story, Matilda and her husband were not right for each other as Matilda is like a leech of despair. <laughs> like, I love it, right? Like, I mean, I think you could see that in if, if like the New Yorker or the Atlantic, like a really big um, publication analyzed this story, wrote a review about it. That's the kind of phrase you would see in that. Uh, super strong, beautiful, um, absolutely beautiful. And I just love that. So, I, I want to say this about the, the writing as I'm reading it. For many of you, you're thinking. Um, I actually wrote this as a comment on one person's, but it applied to a lot of you. So I want to talk about it. Your thinking is like a level seven or eight. Like your thinking is so, 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 so strong, um, really high. But the joy level is like a two. Like some of you, I can see that you're enjoying it. Like, and it comes through in the writing. When you as a writer are not enjoying the process of the writing, the reader can tell. The reader feels it. And if you're even if you're the teacher grading it, right, or evaluating it or giving feedback on it, you can feel it. You can feel when the person is enthusiastic. So how do you how do you make that match? Like how do you find joy in that process? And I think that one of the things is embrace your thinking. I mentioned this earlier, right? Go with the thinking first, focus on the thinking first, and then go back and do the revision, go back and correct the errors, right? Don't, don't worry about getting all of that perfect. Get the thinking out while you have your strong emotional intensity first, while you have your emotional energy first. I would suggest with these, don't go do the writing right now. Wait to do the writing a little bit. Let, let your mind think about it a little bit before you go do the writing. You're tired now. You've been listening to a class for over an hour, right? Wait, give yourself a little bit of time to get some emotional energy back. Don't be afraid to dictate your response first. If the actual writing or typing is hard, just don't be afraid to dictate it first. Google has speech to text built right into Google Drive. You could do it right in Google Drive and then edit it. Honor your thinking by packaging it in a way that people want to open it. Right. So if you get a, a, a gift that's beautifully wrapped, that honors that gift. And when you wrap your thinking in beautiful writing, it honors your thinking. And I would like to invite you, honor that thinking. Good gifts deserve good wrapping. Good thinking deserves 
good writing to go along with it. Your thinking is a gift to the world that you wrap up in your writing. It is the body to your thinking's soul. And if you can learn to love that, it will change your life. It really will. All right, so here's the writing opportunity for today. In Okay, so if you are up through eighth grade, so fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, eighth, through eighth grade, in about 100 words, describe how the story would have been different if Jim had been telling it. If Jim had been telling it instead of Della, if it had been told from the perspective of Jim instead of Della, how would it be different? If you are um, in ninth or 10th grade, compare and contrast this story with a necklace, right? And I think this is kind of a gimme prompt, right? Because we've discussed a lot of that comparison. So, so surprise me a little if you can. Describe the pressures on the characters that led them to behave how they did. So compare the pressure because there's interesting similarities in the pressure and the way that the characters handled that. All right, and then 11th and 12th graders, make the argument that the gifts were unwise. Make the argument that they should not have been given, that there were other ways that existed to show love. So agree with the narrator at the end when he says that they unwisely gave these gifts. Even if you disagree, even if you don't think it was unwise, argue the opinion you don't agree with. Argue that the gifts were unwise. That's how you strengthen yourself when you make the argument that you don't actually agree with. All right, and you will go put it in the Gift of the Magi. And then here is the link to tomorrow's story, The Cask of Amontillado. Now, The Cask of Amontillado is a deceptively simple story. So it looks like just a very plot-driven story with not that much in it, but I think you'll be surprised. And I will see you tomorrow.